As winter sets in with a vengeance, life is becoming harder in Ukrainian cities, and the supply of power and heat become unreliable from Russian missile strikes. Russia's campaign to cripple Ukraine's power infrastructure could therefore trigger a new wave of emigration to Europe, and there is still the threat of a new offensive against Kiev. As Russia's position on the battlefield becomes more precarious, Putin may resort to terroristic tactics against nuclear facilities, as he has before, or other irresponsible actions. Ukraine is on a path to victory, but how long will it take, and what will be the eventual cost? Please like and subscribe to see more great speakers and content on the Silicon Curtain channel. John Spencer is Chair of Urban Warfare Studies at Modern War Institute at West Point. He is a former major in the US Army, retired, and an award-winning college assistant professor and a widely published author in many of the world's top news sources. John Spencer is considered one of the leading experts in military operations in an urban context. He is currently serving as a colonel in the California State Guard with assignment to the 40th Infantry Division, California Army National Guard, as Director of Urban Warfare Training. We'll put a link in the video description to John's latest book, which is a compelling study of leadership and social connection in modern war, called Connected Soldiers. Hey, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for reading all that. <laughs> uh, so one question that really has come up again and again is the rationality of the war. And it seems to an extent that there's a degree of irrationality in the sense that there's a, an absence of a clear strategy on the Russian side and what seems to be absence of clear objectives. I don't know if you agree with that. No, I, I actually would not agree with that. Um I'm not a Putin expert or a Russia expert, but uh, Putin's ambition to reestablish its span of control of former Soviet Union states is is long history of that. Um, its opposition to former satellite states being free and prospering, not under the Russian control, is pretty clear. Even in the invasion, the strategic objective of overthrowing the Ukrainian government, the, the democratically elected government, but keep most things in, in place and just do the switch out of the government so it's more of a pro-Russian faction, pretty straight strategy. There's some, you know, of course, some military nuances to the attempt at that, that goal, at that strategic goal on the invasion on February 24th, but a very um, strong effort to align objective to means, there's just some problems that, that come, that get exposed in war. And now once the war was lost, and I say that with all understanding of military strategy in April of this year, that's where I would start to agree with the irrationality of continuing the war in Ukraine at this scale and for these objectives, You know, now new limited objectives of the Donbass or the four oblasts that were signed you know, illegally, as recognized by the United Nations, illegally signed by Russia as annexed territory of the Russian state. There's some irrationality on continuing this war forward, yes, past that point, past June, July, and now going on. And, and as you know, in, in studying Russia, this is a really a, a deteriorating the Russian state's forms of power, right? Before this war, strategically, Russia was a a legitimate um, nation on the international stage, viewed as one of the most powerful militaries in the world, uh, had economic ties to all around the world. Because of this war, and because the continuing of this war, each day that power gets weakened and the Russian state becomes weaker and it will take generations for it to repair itself. But like you said in the introduction, I agree with you, there is of course a cost to Ukraine. And in and, and, but luckily, you, Ukraine's on the right side of history. Ukraine is fighting for freedom, self determination, human rights. So there's a, a you know fifty plus nations, and I'm sure in reconstruction there'll be even more that is willing to help Ukraine in that sacrifice to stay free. And that that's an interesting topic because just today I think there's been a lot of bickering in the EU about who you know gets to divide the. I won't call it the spoils because that that's quite a negative term there. But basically, there's some bickering about who gets that budget for reconstruction. 
with Poland, of course, sanctioned due to, um, let's say, it deviating from democratic norms. You've got Hungary, which is you know, off the scale. So this problem of unanimity within the EU has reared its head again. Yeah, I mean, there, not to call it, you know, all things war, but that that, that reconstruction will be historic um, in, in the amount of reconstruction in a newly formed demo- democratic state, which will have to fight. There's actually a lot of studies in this in, in when I was in school about that that resource curse, so the influx of reconstruction money and what that can cause in a nation as they manage that, let alone the the the, the partners they're with, but just the impacts of, um, and I know they're trying to get ahead with this, right? There, there's been more than one conference already. That the, I think the 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 French are leading one just this week about you know, getting them immediate uh, reconstruction to like the power grids and things like that. But I, I absolutely agree with you. that that will be a major phase of this war. Will be the post-war situation and what that looks like in Ukraine. And of course, uh, you know, not to be um, you know perhaps too cynical about it, but this large influx of money, especially into building projects, um, could be uh, a trigger for a regression into you know corruption that has historically been an issue in Ukraine, which they've been trying to tackle with some degree of determination. But that much money, it's quite difficult to control, isn't it? So there are risks that come with peace and victory. It is. I mean, and there is self-determination as well. This is Ukraine's decision, Ukraine's democratic processes. Um, but if you know the history of Ukraine and the Maidan and, and, and other efforts were to eliminate this these forms of corruption and uh, um, crony, cronyism and other elements that there is a public eye, there is an access to information unlike ever before. And I, I actually feel pretty confident, like, and this is why when people tell me that you, Ukraine was corrupt, one of the most corrupt countries in, in before this war, I'm like, okay, you know, it's, don't throw you know stones if you live in a glass house. What political system isn't ripe with corruption? It, it is really politics. But I think Ukraine now has stronger partnerships than it's ever had in its history to help it through these processes, through the oversight, and just like they have with the even weapons um, that they've been given and, and all those supplies, and establishing a process which is. Um, transparent, accountable. Um, they fired people, and, and it doesn't get a lot of news. President Zelensky and the parliament have fired a lot of people that they viewed even during the war as not being true to you know, democratic values or even you know, the values that the nation wants to espouse. But absolutely, a pro- you know, there is risk in that. But I feel pretty confident with the partnerships it it is created that they're going to try to wade through those waters when time comes. You engage the the first target you have, which is you know get Ukraine Russians military out of Ukraine. And other stuff that doesn't go uh, really reported. You know, my my real interest is in technology, uh, and I've interviewed a lot of technical entrepreneurs in the Ukrainian sphere. And there are extraordinary advances actually going on, not just in, say, voting systems or they've been applying a lot of electronic systems to government services as a way of reducing the corruption that could happen when you had to deal with officials one on one. Um, But they are becoming a tech powerhouse, aren't they? In fact, you know, they are going to be at the vanguard within Europe of automating many processes within government procurement contracts and so on. So it could well be that this reconstruction effort, if combined with their extraordinary technical innovation, um, could actually prove to be a very uh, positive process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, Ukraine has had a long history of leading the world in in lots of developments. Um, they were the the intellectual capital of the Soviet Union. I mean, I mean, there's so many aspects. I agree with you, and, and even as they advanced in their technological aspects. And we've seen this in just in this war and their, their abil- ability to, um, you know, information is a form of national power, but their, their ability to capitalize using technologies on information to express what's happening in Ukraine, to ensure that the spotlight stays on Ukraine. Um, I'm sure they'll even lead in cybersecurity and how to protect these technological advancements in government services um, that we've seen were before this war, right? I, I even my visit to Kiev um, was interested in finding out how Ukrainian civilians reported enemy activity was through apps 
that were not too old, um, that were government services apps that were turned into information reporting technologies, which is just fascinating, right? So there's a lot that the Ukraine is going to lead the world in. And, and this is why I think um, Ukraine comes out of this, one of the strongest nations of Europe with a lot of healing to do, but they're t they've taught Europe a lot. They've made NATO stronger than it's ever been. Um, they rallied people under similar values. It's just pretty amazing. Well, that was going to be a question I was going to ask later, but I think it's it's very pertinent to sort of uh, ask that now. Um, with this open source intelligence, the use of technology, the use of uh, you know a trusted population and distributing this uh, responsibility for reporting, you know it could be tanks or munitions and positions. Um, how are these learnings going to potentially affect the textbooks for future wars? Yeah, I I personally think it'll have a huge impact. I mean, it's just so fascinating if you dig down what Ukraine has done since the beginning of the war. So it's almost like they've had free access to information, but they've actually controlled. You don't see Ukrainian officers freely reporting. You don't see information about Ukrainian casualties. Um, they're, they're very smart in doing what people used to think that Russia were the masters of, right? Russia was considered the masters of, of propaganda, information warfare, all these elements. And in this war, especially, Russia has been shown to be wanting. Ukraine has been able to mobilize the population to gather information to ensure that the will of the people, the you know, will of the military, will of the world is on their side and stays relevant. Um, I think they'll change the textbook about the fact that you're not going to control information, although Ukraine has shown a very creative ways to do that. You have to thrive within this free-flowing information networks. They've learned some hard lessons from you know, civilians uploading live feeds of their forces that then get hit by Russian artillery and other assets. So they've learned a lot of lessons about electronic um, countermeasures and protection um, that I, I think the world right now is, is, is struggling to keep up with what it will impact the world's military approach to inf what we call information operations, right? The influence operations, deception, information warfare. Um, it's fascinating, really, all the way down to the, you know, single battles, like the Battle of Kharkiv, how they fooled, you know, a lot of people that where the approach was while they were amassing formation secretly um, to create another prong of the offense to how President Zelensky talks to different populations of the world about it his people and his needs, it's really um, historic and it will impact the textbooks for sure. And how difficult is that from your personal experience to keep a major operation like that secret? I mean, you read about this stuff like in the Second World War, uh, Operation Zigzag and these extraordinary uh, espionage efforts. Uh, you know, Operation Mincemeat is probably one of the most uh, bizarre ones. But when you have you know, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of men, equipment, for a huge campaign, how on earth do you keep that safe? Especially when prior to the war and in 2014, the Ukrainian administration was riddled with Russian assets, spies, paid agents. Absolutely. It, uh, it's, it's at a level that I know, I know enough to know that I don't know how it all works. I know it takes everything from space assets um, down to tactical instructions. And there is a bit of you know, controlling for short amounts of time, all amounts of information, even within the soldiers, within yourself. And, and there's actually, um, and this is what, you know, kind of backfired on Russia, where Russia, you know, sent its forces to in, invade Ukraine and held information from its own soldiers in a, in a, you know, valid interest in keeping what we call operational security, what you're asking me, how do you keep that OPSEC uh, from the, from your own soldiers or from the world? And there was no hiding Right, because there is a Western advantage to satellite um, intelligence, signals intelligence, and this again, where where Russia, as a nation, came up wanting, was the ability to control this spectrum of information or intelligence gathering capabilities. You know, Sun Tzu said, you know, surprise is is everything in the war, and so is intelligence. This is also reinforcing the the priority that intelligence has in war. From 
you know, we think that we have this all seeing eye into Ukraine and we have a, you know, this is what I talk about connected soldiers, you know, the veil between the soldiers and the public or the soldiers and their families is gone, but there is still national level assets in which to create, you know, windows of, we call them opportunity. You could also call them windows of um, invisibility you know, using a, a wide uh, technologies and assets and tactics to create that surprise on the battlefield. And this is why Russia, there was no surprise that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. It was a surprise on the day. Then once they crossed the line, everything from traffic cameras to satellites knew where the Russians were coming. And that was an advantage of Ukraine's who had a smaller capability, but could be informed on the exact movements of Russia to then maneuver you know, smaller capabilities to the right place at the right time. How you do it, I ha I know enough to know I don't know how it all works. Um, I, I know that's a great case study on, it's still possible to have the element of surprise in modern warfare. I imagine quite a bit of it is probably classified as well, and we might not know the full extent of it for some, some decades. But um, something else I heard, uh, I think it was uh, Sir Richard Sheriff talking about this, is that Russia seems to be massing troops within Belarus again. And of course, they haven't necessarily pulled Belarus fully into the war. Um, they fired missiles from the territory. They've used it for logistics. But there is a risk, of course, of that country collapsing and turning against its regime, which I think is, uh, that's the apprehension uh, of getting involved. But it does look like there's something going on on that front. So how likely is it that Putin may have another crack at Kiev? and? it may be less surprising this time around. So I'm kind of assuming the Ukrainians will be dug in, prepared and ready for them. Yeah, so it's my military urban warfare opinion that Russia has no chance at Kyiv. It had one chance at Kyiv and it, and it was very close. And a lot of people don't like to discuss how, how close Kyiv was to falling, even though I've studied the Battle of Kyiv extensively. Um, there's a little bit of luck. There's a little bit of will um, but at this point, with what Russian military capabilities are left, and although I agree with you, nobody really knows why they're mobilizing forces in Belarus, not only the Belarus political situation, but it just would make no common sense other than to cause us to talk about it on why mobilize forces in Belarus, because uh, I know how you take down a capital city. There are a few ways. Uh, and almost always are now closed to Russia. Um, it would need hundreds of thousands of troops massed quickly uh, into the capital to do, to achieve that, you know, regime change, decapitalizing, taking of a capital. At this point, um, with the extensive amounts of preparations that the Ukrainians continue to do, and that's what I found when I visited, you know, the territorial defenses really community defenders now that are ready and that are, as I met, even in Bucha, they were healing, but they were also training. Like we're, we're waiting for them to, them to come back. Although I, you know, of the, you, know, you can never talk in certainties about war, but it's extremely unlikely that Russia would do that unless maybe it would cross the border just as a diversion, right? Because Russia also still tries to do, you know, deception, um, and, and allocate resources to prevent Ukraine from massing its re resources, you know, Transnistria, Moldova, like, all these things that it can do to, like, you have to address them, right? You have to keep forces in Kyiv to protect Kyiv on top of, of the various, you know, civilian populations and all that that, that are there. But you know, it, it, I, I would, it's just not possible. It's just not possible for Russia to mass on Kiev again. And it, yeah, it could be quite a good feint. I mean, we don't know how many uh, vehicles or whatever. We've seen some markings and maybe the fact that they are completely obvious and you actually are seeing this taking place suggests it may be a rather clumsy effort to, to distract. Coming back to the irrationality question, though, I mean, I think everyone's seen those images of Bakhmut, um, which strategically... You know, you have to ask, is it worth anything at all? You know, in economic terms, in strategic terms, it seems to have almost no value. And yet tens of thousands of Russian lives are being thrown at this. And there are scenes that are 
reminiscent of the First World War, with the same kind of incremental gains you might have got from trench warfare uh, in the Somme, uh, you know, inches per day, not not kilometers. Yeah, I uh, 100 percent agree. One of the issues is that we impose a Western value system on top of Russia. Russia does not care about losing the amount. It doesn't have the casualty aversion that other people have. Um, as we've seen just in this war and what it's willing to sacrifice, you know, tactically, 100% agree. We all agree that Bakhmut tactically, even in, in the Donbass region, makes no sense to commit that amount of resources. But if I was to put myself in Russian shoes and based on losing everywhere, could you give an operational commander uh, or even a, a an area commander like that the mission to you know, just continue fighting, continue incremental gains. Uh, I understand you're losing a lot of people, uh, but it's better than losing everywhere. So there is some rationality to it, but absolutely on the operational and especially, which is where you have to keep talking about strategically for Putin and the Russian government to achieve their objectives in Ukraine sacrificing tens of thousands of people to take Bakhmut makes no sense. But there is yeah, you know, there is a bit of sense on, man, I just, we're losing everywhere. Uh, we've lost Kherson. We're losing everywhere. You know, give me something that, that we can show and spin to, even if they raise a flag on top of Bakhmut, which again, tactically, is not even a critical crossroads of a major supply route. It would be something for them to say that that they're not 100% losing while they're buying time, right? I actually, even in the Battle of Kiev or all the battles, people discount the factor of time on the battlefield. Russia needs time to train, even the ones in Belarus that are being getting trained by Belarusian military, which you know, it's safe for uh, the Belarusian government to do that. Russia needs time to train new formations to be of a military capability in Ukraine. In Bakhmut, it does require the Ukrainians to apply resources to it. So is it buying time? Is that an objective? It could be. Could be political, I guess, as well, because, of course, it's reported that uh, the Wagner forces are predominantly massed around Bakhmut. So there could even be an internal sort of struggle or, you know, trying to show that uh, Wagner is able to achieve success when the regular army cannot. So... Yeah, I wouldn't discount some rationality in terms of uh, internal political posturing. Absolutely. You can never discount leadership in, in war, leadership and personalities. So we know that Wagner and Prigozhin and others are invested in, in Bakhmut. They're invested on showing that they can win when all Russia's you know, military and other commanders are losing. There's also a bit of you know, what helps with casualty aversion also is that we know that Wagner Group... Um, emptied the prisons of somewhere around 20,000 prisoners to fight in Russia or to fight in Ukraine. So who, what Russian cares about a, a murderer or a rapist dying? Not many. So that's, that could be another reason why Wagner has been given the lead to take this ground. But absolutely, I agree with you. There is personalities involved in this, whether it's hold it, you know, give me a win at all costs or Pergoza saying, I will get you a win and, and the investments that, that whatever their ambitions are in life and in politics, it supports that. Let's turn to this question of leadership, because I know you've written very compellingly about that. And it's a theme that comes through very strongly from many of the podcasts that you've done. Um, let's look at the Ukrainian leadership, because, of course, the Western media focuses on Zelensky. And of course, he's the big figure. But actually, the ability to self-organize, the ability to work in a more horizontal fashion, that actually goes from bottom to top, uh, it seems, in Ukrainian society. I know you've, you've, you've seen this at first hand, and it contrasts very starkly with the top-down approach of the Russian military, society, politics, propaganda, you name it. It's a completely different uh, setup. Yeah, absolutely. And that's there's a bit of culture in that, right? Even in the U.S. military, we have this thing called can-do. Even when it seems impossible, the culturally we should, we can do that. We we will make all means to do it. I mean, leadership is is pretty clear as what leadership is defined as. You're providing purpose, direction, and motivation. 
you're right that we we talk a lot about Zelensky and he will go down in history as one of the greatest leaders of modern era on the level of you know Washington, Churchill, others. Um, people rise to the occasion and, and that that man, that president, that leader has risen to the occasion for his nation uh, and everything he says. And, and, and it, it's just amazing. But then you have, you know, Zeluzhny is the quiet general who's doing the un- impossible with the military to include from the first day to today, um, organizing, like you said, self-organizing. But even on the streets, as I went around Ukraine, I felt that cultural aspect of can do. Uh, they have the will to fight. Uh, they actually have a lot of veterans in their communities, which I found very fascinating as well. You know, grandfathers who who had served, conscripted into the Soviet army in the late seventies, and even fought in the you know in in Eastern Ukraine in the late two thousands, and now are back in their communities, who self organized fighting formations to hold to buy time for the the military. And, I, and also seeing a leveling up across Ukraine. Um, while Ukraine does have a, you know, a a mandatory, you know, all males must stay in a country, its actual has done very little conscription um, based on the volunteers to fight for Ukraine, to fight for their freedom. It hasn't had to call up Ukrainian men who have never served in the military with no military experience up to this point, as far as I know. That speaks a lot to their their will to fight. But you're right. You can have a lot of will to fight, but you also need the leadership across the force, across echelon um, to make this all work and, and to do these amazing things with very small capability and being overmatched in lots of areas. But one of the areas they're not overmatched is in leadership. And that transfers over to the civilian sphere as well, doesn't it? Because it doesn't just arise in the military, you know, from nowhere. It comes organically from the wider society. And we saw that through Maidan, through the huge self-organizing infrastructure that would have had to be created to feed tens of thousands of people in the freezing winter. I mean, that's the impression I get of Maidan. I, I know propagandists still are harking on that it's a proxy war, it's NATO's fault. My dad was a CIA coup. I mean, it's easy to throw these kind of uh, things out there. But when you look at the logistical requirements of something like my dad or supporting civilians right now in those besieged cities, you cannot do it from the top down, can you? Government alone cannot solve those problems. You need people to self-organize. Yeah, and this is the the benefit I've been given is my access to the Ukrainian people is to, to, to meet these non-military leaders, like the head of the Ukrainian railroads, which is considered Ukraine's second army. What he has been able to do with his thousands of workers, um, the leadership is, is is centered on values. And you, if you've ever heard me talk, that you, you know about that. It isn't about being assigned a position. It's about inspiring others to do what we all know needs to be done. But there's also a bit of self-sacrifice, service, uh, all of that that goes into that, and everybody I've I've talked to and had the pleasure of listening to or talking to, like um, the head of the Harki Fire Department, who, you know, who lived in in Harki from day one, putting out fires and sacrifice of his family, living with his people in this in the firehouse. Um, it's just amazing what Ukraine is showing and the unity, right? So leadership is also about inclusion, right? We say that. I don't think it's about diversity. I think it's about inclusion. And Ukraine has opened its communities, its homes, its everything to anybody who's willing to help Ukraine, help Ukrainian people, um, whether that's the the armies of non-government organizations, or I've known people who who just have gone into Ukraine and said, I want to help. You know, and, and they've joined services of people who are you know, delivering food to the cutoff regions of Ukraine at great peril to themselves. And you're, like you said, self-organizing um, under people who step up to be the leadership, but centered on those values, right? So that's that's where you see a cultural element of being Ukrainian and a cultural element of this is not about me or profit or anything. It's about service to the idea of being Ukrainian and of Ukraine itself. And, it, and I think Ukraine can, and this is what I felt when I went there, right? That unity of the people that 
even in my own country, sometimes we seem to forget that that is what, you know, life is about. It's about community. It's about belonging, meaning. In, in, in Ukraine, while well, they're under great sacrifice and great uh, harm by the Russian people, they've also been recognizing within themselves what it is to be, what does that mean to be Ukrainian and, and to be in the part of that struggle like they did in the Maidan, as you as you watched and I watched that as well, that was a, a, a people's movement with a very specific purpose to create a, you know, a new presidential election, a new democratic process. Uh, so all those naysayers you know, that just use misinformation, really Russian talking points, are just not informed about what's going on on the ground, not just by the military, but like like I said, the, you know, from the train services to the now the power industry. And you've seen that they do just the unbelievable, the unthinkable, um, surprising the world in you know, whether it's turning a drone into a long range missile to keep you. Know, they had trains running to Har to Harrison the day after Harrison was liberated. I mean, that takes leadership, commitment and values. And of course, Russia is always seeking to weaponize the divisions amongst its enemies and you know, since 2016, it's had a degree of success both in the UK and the US. What what strikes me about the Ukrainians is they've not been under any less uh, pressure from the propagandists, in fact, more because they've essentially been at war since 2014. And yet the awareness of propaganda and how it works, the awareness of media and how it can be manipulated does seem to be rising in, in Ukraine. But underneath that, it's driven by a sense of ownership or having a stake in society and i wanted to get your view because we've all seen the images of russians fleeing uh fleeing conscription not necessarily uh in protest against the war i think it's a clear distinction there they're quite understandably fleeing to save their own lives but it also talks to the idea that they do not have a stake and they do not feel they have a stake in that country's future it's a very different psychology isn't it Hundred percent. I mean, out of all the strategic blunders that have been Putin's and Putin's alone, what a strategic blunder to unite Ukraine. Um, I met a lot of people in Ukraine who didn't vote for President Zelensky, who actually probably don't like him, um, but a hundred percent agree with what he's done, what his what their country is doing, um, supportive of resisting and, and, and until the, all the borders are reestablished. He united Ukraine with a hope to divide them, um, which he's had some success in the past. He not only united Ukraine and, and it forever will be changed and will forever will be stronger. And, and he united NATO, which is an organization that was faltering as a, a, the reason they existed and um, commitment to the alliance and all that. He united it and grew it. Uh, he, he has united much of Europe under, you know, what the future should be like within every individual country and as a united faction. Uh, and he has divided his own people, right? So you know better than I do that Russia or the Soviet Union is a very loose conglomeration of many ethnicities with you know, long histories of, of themselves. And it's a very fragile, very, um, although Putin has, you know, did what he's done for the last few decades to, to unite them. But the Ukraine has divided so many. When he had, he tried to mobilize 300,000, 400,000, but 400 to 700,000 men fled the country. And that's the generational impact that I think I was talking about in the beginning that Russia has had. That, that is the, the true art of politics is to unite people. And that's the strategic blunder of Putin is he's united everybody else and divided his own people. Well, let's turn to another one of his uh, successes, which, of course, is is uh, surrendering Kherson. Um, and it was believed there would be you know, Stalingrad style street to street fighting. It was surrendered with barely a whimper. Um, do you think, though, this now lays the ground for Crimea itself to be taken at some point between now and maybe, you know, next autumn? So. I wouldn't say that. So yes, yes, and yes, with a lot of caveats. Um, Harrison definitely didn't fall with 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 little fighting. 
I always, as an urban warfare guy, you know, reached out lots and lots to say, well, when is that close house to house fighting, the destructive fights that we've seen in the last 20 years for urban terrain start? Terrain matters. And Harrison was very unique with its um, the large natural obstacle of the Dnieper River running through and separating Russian forces from themselves. But Ukraine worked for weeks to use their Western weapons to cut off the Russian form forces on one side of the river, which then put the formation at such a intenable position that they had to run. And I think the only reason they held for as long as they did was Russia was hoping for a political change in Ukraine's alliances, especially at the U.S. midterms, that they were waiting to see if there could be a fracture in Ukraine's alliances before they completely abandoned the city of Kherson. Crimea is, is a very wicked problem. There's, uh, you know, there is military capability question. And then there's also a much broader question um, that has got to be left up to the Ukrainian people. Crimea has a, a deep history beyond Ukraine and Russia. Um, it is Ukraine. It was, it, that is not uh, arguable. But what's, what, can be, what will be the, the end state for Crimea? Can Ukraine uh, advance and reestablish its sovereign borders from 1991 on? Yes. Will they? Uh, all wars, politics by other means, we'll see what that has. As of today, they, they say they will, and that President Zelensky wants to end the war with relaxing on Crimean beach. Uh, that is not, not for us or anybody else to say. Does it open the door? Absolutely, it opens the door. There's a lot of fighting that has to be done before that door gets open, but it'll be a question of whether that is Russia's no fail. Um, is the Donbass, you know, this is the problem with the, you know, understanding what the objectives of Russia or Ukraine are at this point. You know, it's stated after the strategic failure in April that it was, you know, the Donbass and Crimea, but then it still wanted the land bridge. And, the, you know, there's other decisions here that we just don't understand. All wars end in, in a political settlement. That That is true. It'll be Ukraine's position of strength to determine what that looks like. If it's a giant DMZ between Russia and Ukraine, um, is it a, a new elections in, in, in different parts that aren't you know, just sham forced by gunpoint voting that, that we've seen Russia do? Who knows? Um, could Ukraine take Crimea? Absolutely. Uh, what that looks like militarily and what that looks like politically is unknown. And even from the start of the war and going back through the last sort of uh, 10 years at least, I think there's been a tendency, especially amongst sort of military analysts, potentially those who have not sort of served or have practical experience, to overestimate the capability of the Russian military, overestimate the quality of their equipment and their ability to deploy it, but also the massive, massive uh, under um, estimation of the impact of nepotism and corruption within the Russian system. Um, and even now, a lot of people are still talking about this idea of a, a seasonal war and it's winter and nothing will happen. Again, I, I think people are underestimating the, abil underestimating the ability of, of Russia to collapse or mess up. Yeah. I mean, I think Russia would, would love for the war to slow down and freeze, pun intended, over the winter. That's not going to happen. Ukraine has been very, very... Um, straightforward with its actions, that it will not slow down and and to achieve their objectives. I agree with you on the nepotism and the corruption. That really, I think even the across echelon in the Russian government and leadership was unknown, all the way down to the individual military districts of reporting and readiness. Which in all militaries is kind of an issue of you know, you report you're good, but you, you know, and that's what you see on paper. And then war exposes where you, where there are years of either lack of maintenance or possible corruption and selling off equipment and things like that. A hundred percent. And that's, again, this, another strategic blunder of Putin is to test his military in this scale of an operation and to expose to the world that you're, you're not, it's not in the second most powerful. You're not even the 10th most powerful. And that means a lot to its partners like China because China doesn't like to back weakness and russia every day continues exposes its weakness and what its military capabilities are 
right? It has other forms of national power, but from from military power capability, it's been shown wanting. That's not to say it's not dangerous. It's not big. It's not does have military capabilities as we've seen even in his bombing campaign, but it's really exposed the 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 rot that is within it. Can it recover from this? Um, it sacrificed so much in Ukraine in leadership. Right? You don't you don't just grow back generals. You don't grow back mid level officers that is lost. That takes generations to recover. And every day it continues. It's really fascinating to watch that. This is the irrationality we're talking about. It that every day it continues this war, whether it's strategic bombing capability in missiles or senior leaders that lead your military, um, your trainers, it's, it's trainers in the Ukraine. It'll take decades and decades for Russia. If it ever comes to senses or overthrows Putin and Putin falls out of a, a building like, like other people in, in Russia do, it will take decades for Russia to recover from this campaign, which in the grand scheme of Russia as a federation, you, I hope the people are asking, at least in in the, the the places that matter, like Moscow, St. Petersburg, is was it worth it? Uh, I don't I don't know if we in the military history annals will say in any way, shape, it could be viewed as well. That was worth it. Absolutely, because even though Russia you know, lost in Finland, uh, well, lost eventually, it it sort of uh, managed to regain some of that. But it against a tiny nation, it really didn't uh, do particularly well and, and lost masses and masses of troops. But in the grand scheme of things. You know, the Soviet Union was quite a vigorous society uh, with a youthful, relatively youthful population. It's a totally different demographic at that point. And it was on that curve of industrialization. Now you're looking at a, a deindustrialized society um, with appalling demographics and with some of its brightest talents uh, and, and better off citizens having fled its territory. I mean, it looks very poor. And then you've got its so-called strategic partners like India and China that are actually taking them to the cleaners when it comes to buying their hydrocarbons. You know, they they can't be selling this stuff at much more um, above a minimal margin these days. Yeah, I mean, I know that's your that's not my area of expertise, but I can only sit back and watch. I mean, it's almost like uh, again, there's many forms of national power, but Russia's strength is its petros and other exports, and it, it just woke up Europe who didn't like being uh, dependent on Russia. Now they have a lot of motivation to make the sacrifices and the change to be less dependent on Russia for its supplies. And while they, there are many countries in Europe that are very dependent on it, there, there, there's going to be a lot less after this war than there was at the beginning of this war. So it's rumored as well that Russia is uh, gearing up for another round of um, conscription, um, I think conscription doesn't really cover it, though, does it? Sort of arbitrary press ganging um, 18th century style is really what we're seeing here. But if they are going to be scraping the barrel for potentially tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of essentially the sort of dregs of society or old men or prisoners, um, and they potentially don't have the equipment to supply them with, this is this is really going to turn into a very fragile situation if they go ahead with that. Absolutely. Although the uh, one I never, you never trust what Russia says. You almost get to the point where whatever they say, they actually mean the exact opposite. Where Russia has been very adamant lately that they will not do another partial mobilization. I don't even know what partial means. Uh, like you said, that it, they had a goal. Who knows that they achieved it? But they definitely loaded buses full of people. I really thought it was interesting where they they went to the borders where people were escaping. And had trailers, which then they could throw the people trying to escape into the trailers and then rush them to the front line. This is not how you build a military. This is not how you mobilize a nation. Uh, as we know in, across history and in just the history of mobilization efforts, you need a very large training base um, to train individuals and then a system in which to plug those newly trained individuals. It takes you know months to create a private. It takes years to create a sergeant or an officer. Um I don't think this war will go on for years personally. Of course, there may be conflict between Ukraine and Russia for, for years, but the war at this pace um, with these aims by Russia cannot continue because no matter how many people it forces into Ukraine, 
you know, a, a private with a few days to a few weeks, maybe in a few months, is not a military capability. If it can't be plugged into a military organization with equipment, like you were saying, that they just don't have. I mean, they're turning to North Korea for artillery, Iran for drones, uh, anybody who can help them. They're taking, and this is actually, I thought it was a meme, but it's actually legitimate where they're, they're, they have a requirement to gather washers off of the Ukrainian battlefield because the chips and the processors in those washers can actually help them and the, because of the sanctions are actually working. Uh, manpower is not, it is a, a big issue for Russia, but that is not his number one issue of military capability in Ukraine if I really knew what their objectives really were. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you that the rumor is probably true just because Russia said it's not that they will call up more people to throw into Russia, to Ukraine to die. I do have issues with casualty figures as well. Like We really don't know what either side has lost in this, both in killed or wounded. But I sure do see a lot of like freezer trains and things like that that Ukraine has trying to take care of, you know, killed on the battlefield that seem to be a lot. Uh, and Russia just keeps calling up more and more people so they seem to not to be doing very well, but manpower is not their biggest concern. Um, plus, like like we're talking about, I just saw today that Putin himself has canceled his you know his his annual address to the the Federal Assembly and his annual speech to the public. You know things aren't going well, and I don't think another mobilization would help in that effort. I think it, it it's uh, he's gone deeper into the bunker, hasn't he? Uh, you know, I I I got to speak to um, the Russian diplomat who had uh, escaped, the only official, in fact, who has basically defected from the regime, and he said something I think very interesting, which was that uh, prior to COVID, um, they would have a degree of not independence in the way that perhaps uh, you know a diplomatic service would have in in other countries like the US but they had a degree of organization at a local level when it came to covid that all stopped and that was completely taken away and then you would just get your instructions from on high from moscow and all you know independence of thought such as it was at a local level completely vanished what we're seeing now is 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 an even more concentrated version of that, aren't we? You know, Putin in the bunker controlling everything for good or ill, um, with very little delegation uh, further down. Yeah, and again, this is your expertise, but he actually lives in a bunker. Doesn't live in Moscow. He he's very secluded from reality. Very 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 Hitler Hitleresque is a, if I can use that word um, in, in his. You're going deeper and we may, this may end in a very similar bunker situation, but yeah, very, very odd um, in, in that use, the control of everything from battlefield decisions to um, political decisions that seem to be very irrational in the pursuit of any objective, whether that's even to stay in power, like some of it just doesn't make sense. And the last area I wanted to focus on really is to take it back to Kiev and Ukraine. And of course, we had the momentous news this week that a number of Patriot missile batteries are going to be provided at last. Obviously, there's the question of if those have been supplied in, say, the spring or the summer, it would have saved not just many thousands of lives, um, but it would have saved potentially this crippling strikes on on infrastructure. So that's that's one question. You know, what does Ukraine need? Why didn't it get it sort of faster? But the other interesting question, of course, is they seem to have developed quite a bit of capabilities themselves to actually take out these Shahid drones uh, in this strike yesterday. I think there were 17 and 100 percent of them were shot out of the sky. So, again, what learnings are there going to be uh, from this incredible agility and adaptability the Ukrainians seem to be uh, exhibiting? Yeah, absolutely. So they've been able to take whatever the minimum, although on the grand scheme, of course, the world has given a lot, on the needs to keep Russian uh, or to defeat Russia, it's actually been very small to the what has actually been needed. It's been very incremental in the different capabilities it's asked from from february uh, i remember a video president Zinsky did just naming the things he needs mlrs um s300s and all these things that based on political 
politics, right? All war is politics by other means. There's risk dis- calculation. This is a global war. I mean, Putin is imposing a global tax on the world. Every country around the world is paying for his um, his imperial interests and his legal war in Ukraine. You know, the Patriots, a great announcement. I agree with you. If it would have just been given two months ago, it may have saved maybe not lives, but billions of dollars of infrastructure that will have to be rebuilt um, as you as we we were already talking about i mean the ukraine or the patriot doesn't really help against these cheap low flying slow moving iranian drones and and the the uh, the islamic regime should heavily be sanctioned even more than it already is for its support to russia's genocide in ukraine but the patriot is a huge um great day to ukraine to receive that to help against short range ballistic missiles, bombers, jets, um, and, and protect at least a small portion of Ukraine, right? It's hard to to put an umbrella over all of Ukraine, but you can definitely help support strategic infrastructure, uh, Kiev, the seat of political power. Um, 100% that was needed a long time ago, and I've been frustrated from the beginning at our incremental uh, aid, although it's been great and it's been billions of dollars, and that's the return on investment to the glow to the world will be tenfold. Um, not allowing Putin to rewrite the history of the world and what nations can and can't do to themselves, and what does sovereignty mean, and what does a nuclear power can do, and all of that. Uh, but the Patriots, great, great news to protect against missiles. Uh, you're right, Ukraine has done some amazing things even in air defense from using, you know, 1970s technologies like the, the Gephardt that they were given or any air defense systems to help protect itself. But Russia did achieve a lot of results. It turned Ukraine black. That doesn't mean Ukraine um, doesn't get back up on its feet every time it gets knocked down and they've had to pay a price at the slow um, aid that has come in. All of it's been used to great effect. I mean, it took four, just four MLRS rocket systems and achieved amazing things. But I also know each time that something small is given, it opens the door for other countries to give similar items or it opens the door for more to follow. Because right now, the word is one battery of of Patriot missile defense systems, and it needs a lot more than one. But it's usually, um, this is the way it's played out, unfortunately, is that once we assume leadership, like the U.S. assumes leadership in giving something, it opens the door for other countries to do the same. Absolutely. And uh, I read the U.K. had supplied some helicopters, which is, you know, a bit of a a, a novel uh, one as well. And that potentially opens other countries up to do the same. And I mean, the question that comes from those aerial terror tactics they they don't work. They've never worked in history, have they? From the Battle of Britain to Guernica, well, Guernica perhaps in Spain, they did triumph the fascists there. But generally speaking, you cannot coerce a civilian population into giving up to an enemy. No, no, you can't. And I agree with you in what it just teaching strategy and air power strategy, air power theory. Um, it's, it's just not proven, especially. Like, cause look, everybody wants to throw out the nuclear card of what Nagasaki and Hiroshima did. That was a different world where the opponent didn't have this, you know, capabilities where the opponent didn't have a an alliance of fifty plus nations with advanced capabilities. Um, this idea that you can coerce through just bombing a population to do your will or to force the politicians to come to the political table, it, it just is actually the opposite. Again, going back to Bakhmut, but was the bombing, is the bombing just a tactic of an inferior force who doesn't have any other options to turn to? So he does that to buy time because it it definitely required Ukraine to allocate resources to bringing the power back to millions and millions of civilians where Russia has weaponized. He's almost turned weather into a weapon of mass destruction. And that the, the history and the nation should, or the world should make him pay for that. Yeah, I actually have frustrations myself on, you know, everything that we've done on post World War II to not allow somebody like Putin to do this is still happening. Putin's still using war crimes as a form of warfare, still not abided by the Geneva Conventions, not abided by the UN Charter. Um, when is enough enough? 
to where we're actually going to do the things that we, the world, to include the Soviet Union, said that we would no longer allow to happen around the world. And that's why we stood up the United Nations and we created the Geneva Conventions. All of this, I think that sometimes gets passed over in the in the conversations too, is that Putin's really disregarding everything that was done post-World War II. And we're facing an extraordinary world, aren't we? One which we potentially didn't experience, and that is a, a new divide in Europe. You know, I was at the side of the Berlin Wall in 1990, sure after, shortly after it came down. We're now facing a new divide across Europe, a little further east than it was before, but um, extraordinary times. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where I agree with some people that um, you know, the world has changed. This war has changed the world. It will change the world. This is not about a, a border dispute. This is about sovereignty. This is about uh, recolonization. This is about upholding um, the uh, multi-international organizations and the global international order that we all thrive under. And to be clear, but I don't think the world can continue with Putin in power. Well, John, no you know, so, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely agree. There's no moving forward while he still is controlling the levers. Um, well, John, I'm so grateful to you for spending so much time talking to me. It's been a, an immense pleasure. Um, and I advise everybody to read your book on urban warfare um, and Connected Soldiers. And we'll put a link in the video description to to those. But thank you. Thank you.